back, everybody. I'm Jared Ball. This is another edition of I Mix What I Like here at the Real News Network, where we're continuing our conversation with Dr. Rico Chapman and Shaheen Arif Dean. And in this segment, we're going to be talking with them about uh, the continuing comparisons between the black consciousness movement and the black liberation struggle here in the United States, particularly after Mandela there and after Obama here. And if you've missed them, please go back to the Real News Network and check out our previous segments with Dr. Chapman and Shaheen R.F. Dean. Fellas, welcome back to the, to the program. Thanks. Hey, thanks. So let's pick up on that. Uh, just as I said there in the intro, uh, you know, Shaheen, in some of your lyrics with Prophets of the City, you're talking about particularly in the song Never Again, there are references uh, uh, sort of praising the, the, black, the black consciousness and, and anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa uh, and praising Nelson Mandela. But as we've heard over the years, uh, since Mandela's release in the so-called post-apartheid moment, there has been uh, a lot left undone uh, and too many of the same uh, uh, um, uh, pre-apartheid relationships continue, whether it's 87% of the land still in the hands of the 13% white minority, the control of the economic system and the military still controlled often by the white minority, the resources often do not make it to the townships and to the, the black op oppressed communities, much like before. Uh, how do you all... Uh, Think about that. How do you all address that? Or what are your thoughts now uh, in, in, uh, as we've moved this far away from uh, post-apartheid so-called and after the, the, the passing not too long ago of Nelson Mandela? I think there's two things. Um, one is when we have these icons that we look up to and pull them up to a point where they are free from scrutiny. Um, I think that's very dangerous, um, whether it's from what's happening to Bill Cosby, <laughs> Bill Cosby now, to Mandela in terms of the decisions that he's made. Um, he was seen as this kind of messiah figure, and there were really, really bad decisions that were made that we actually feel the effects of right now. So I think that's the one thing. The second thing is for us, and when I say us, I'm speaking from many members in the hip hop community, uh, as being that we, our analysis of racism and white supremacist ideology didn't take into account the role capitalism plays in that. And then by extension also patriarchy. And so when it was okay, yeah, we have the right to vote and we are the majority and blah, 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 blah. This is freedom. <clears throat> the song Never Again was written the day after Mandela's speech. So there was still this euphoria, still this excitement and all kinds of expectation, you know. And as time grew and went along, you started to see, okay, um, South Africa actually went from a market-driven uh, but kind of welfare state of the RDP uh, to the, the gear policy that's like straight up neoliberalism. And what happened was you had the replacement of white CEOs with black faces, um, some growth of a black elite, and um, like, like you mentioned in the beginning of the segment, um, old white money and old white foreign money especially still controls Africa to a large degree. That neo-colonial relationship is still very, very strong. You know, the only, just real quick, uh, the only value that I found in the film Invictus starring Morgan Freeman was the scene oh. where he's in the car and the sister asks him, why are you going so far out of your way to, 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 to make you know, friends with this white football team? Uh, and his response was because they still control the economy. Uh, and I thought that that was that one line was was all the value I saw uh, in, in that film. But it was a, it, I thought it was a, a powerful statement and one that I thought got lo got lost in the conversation about that film and a lot of the conversation about post apartheid South Africa. Uh, Rico, the same thing here. Um, mm -hmm. There's been, uh, you know, we were talking off air about some of my own personal s struggles with, with attempts that we've seen in academia and other spaces of people to draw these one-to-one -one connections between Barack Obama and the black power movement in this country, where, mm -hmm. as I see him, as, the, as, as, as Shaheen mentioned, the, the neoliberal imposition of a mm -hmm. black-faced politician on, onto a very similarly focused 
white capitalist establishment, imperial establishment. Uh, mm-hmm. What are your what is your sense of of, of that? Uh, particularly as as we're we're taping this the the day after uh, Darren Wilson was was not indicted for killing Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, how do you see the, the similarities in what happened or has not happened in South Africa post-apartheid and what is or is not happening here in the United States post-Obama in this so-called post-racial moment? All right. Um, <clears throat> just to follow up on what Shaheen uh, mentioned in terms of, of, of the African masses really getting starstruck um, it seems as if conditions have have gotten worse in terms of police brutality, um, and, and especially here in the United States. And well, we can also shoot that across the the water to South Africa when when the miners got gunned down by the police. So even though we're in this like Americana mind, right? That's right. Yeah, yep. we're in this so called post so called post racial moment. And uh, I, that's just a myth because this violence that's been handed down to us uh, by, by this white power structure still exists. And you just mentioned Darren Wilson being being found not guilty. I mean, that's just a prime example. Of saying well, he we, wasn't we found not off. guilty because he didn't even get to trial. They didn't. Yeah, they decided yeah, yeah, not to exactly. indict him. That was. You know, I just want to make right. that point clear. Right. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, so I mean, it, it's clear that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of our uh, uh, racial relations. And I think it's a power dynamic. You know, you, you, power concedes nothing without demand and, and, and you, you can't demand anything with your hands out. So, you know, and, and I agree in terms of, of President Obama, I mean, he just serves a position. It, it's, it's, we can't compare him to a, a Marcus Garvey who was like a nation builder, you know. Um, or, or or those uh, organizers in South Africa, say Robert Sabuque, who actually built built political parties, you know. But but he's going into a political system. And he's just a figurehead. So I think we we've asked we're asking a little bit too much uh, out out of uh, this particular uh, president. But in any case, uh, I think the parallels between South Africa and the United States in terms of race relations, in terms of how we see ourselves as a as a community, uh, we we have some victories, but for the most part, uh, we still have a long way to go in terms of our, our employment rates, uh, our responses with uh, this police brutality, also our own our own hangups with uh, black on black crime. So going back to black consciousness and the black liberation struggle, it was always about ideology. It was always about a, a psychological awakening uh, of, like I mentioned earlier, a black man, you're on your own concept, as Biko said. And once we get that idea that, you know, we have to, you know, go it alone, pretty much, we can't expect a white supremacist power structure to be sympathetic to, you know, the, the needs and wants of the African masses. And that's, that's my, my spin on that's my take on it. Of so- course, I can be wrong. So let's let's in, in this in this last few minutes that we have go back to where we sort of began with the with your work and this look at hip hop's relationship to political struggle or hip hop activism as some continue to call it. You know, here in the United States, there's this there's this tremendous commercial imposition on the art form that prevents many of of the more politically minded and or vo- overtly radical artists from being heard. Uh, but we have seen hip hop somewhat respond positively in, in a good way to what's been happening. Uh, in Ferguson, what's happened to Eric Gardner in New York and other instances of police brutality, whether it's J. Cole's song or Talib Kweli going out there or or the consistent sort of political messages of Wise Intelligent and Rebel Diaz, uh, uh, among others. Uh, what do you two, what, what could you both tell us about particularly uh, hip hop in South Africa uh, today and its relationship to the ongoing political struggle there um, and maybe its own response to, to what's been happening to the African diaspora outside of the continent? Uh, and, and Professor Chapman, let's start with you and get your, your, your final thoughts on, on, on this topic. Um, <clears throat> well, t- to be honest, a lot of the hip hop heads on this side don't follow South African hip hop as, as I think we should. Uh, there, there are pockets of 
quote unquote, and I hate to use the word conscious rappers, right, uh, right. because you know, because there, there's that box again that that Shaheen mentioned. But I think, I think I, what our article does, what our book chapter does, it begins to shed a light on on the global hip hop arena, and and how we do we do have a global fight, and hip hop has a responsibility uh, to make known some of some of our struggles, and and I think here in the United States, there is a, there's beginning to be a a slight shift in the content of hip hop from my, from my perspective, even though we still have the mainstream hip hop that's taking precedent in the media, but on the underground level, I think there's, there's, there's been a, a strong shift towards more content relevant, more struggle related, more liberation movement themed uh, music. And um, I was listening to uh, who was oh Evil Knievel. Uh, Banner did uh, his latest single, Evil Knievel, right. where he addresses some some of these issues. Uh, I think Ti did a, a, a song about Trayvon and Mike Brown just recently. So I think there's there's a shift, and a lot of our a lot of these rappers who are mainstream are getting older now. So some of the content is not relevant for their lives. So that may be part of it as well, but I think there is a shift in the music, and uh, and if we follow South Africa and build this network, I, I think we can have a, a global understanding of what's going on with our people uh, worldwide. Well, that's that's certainly what's up, you know. And even Kendrick Lamar has said recently he wants to yeah. step up his game and be more like Marvin Gaye uh, in terms of his relationship to to the community and and and, and uh, the broader world. You know, we can only hope. One can only hope because I certainly don't right. want Marvin Gaye his name only be brought up today in context mm-hmm. in relationship to to the to the uh, uh, cultural appropriation of Robin Thicke. Uh, mm-hmm. But but right. Shaheen, you know, g- give us your concluding thoughts on this. What what right. what what could you tell us? A few things. Um, I think that there's this interesting thing about how hip hop is conceived of. Um, I think there are so many different schools of thought, you know, um, and um, the U.S.'s impact in terms of the industry, in terms of a whole bunch of other things, can also be felt in South Africa. So there are MCs who are concerned about being popular only, uh, who don't believe um, they want to be identified as being political or whatever else, and they are folks who want to get involved on the ground, etc., etc. The way I see it is, hip hop is made by human beings. Human beings are complex. Hip hop isn't this kind of magical sphere and tool, you know, that possesses yeah. any inherent quality for revolution. It's aggressive, it has a, res- a resistive vibe to it, but it's not necessarily progressive. It's not necessarily um, down for revolution, although these words get used and thrown around in songs all the time. I think it's the human beings that hold on to it and what, and it depends on what we do with it. So for argument's sake, I, I-, I love this quote where it says, um, you know, class consciousness is knowing um, which side of the fence you're on. Um, class analysis is knowing who's there with you, <laughs> you know? And you could probably say class struggle is knowing what the tools are that's going to be effective that you're going to use, you know what I mean? And so to just split about um, oppression and all of those kinds of things, I don't necessarily see that as being the be all and end all of struggle because the state uses those things. I went to a protest last night, you know, and you had cops there and people probably had to um, get a permit to protest and they they were given a time period by what time you needed to disperse and whatever. And so very often what we say can become like a valve, an outlet system to let it out of your system so you can go back to the same old the next day. So for me, those words need to be accompanied by actions and those actions and words need to be accountable to a movement yeah. and a movement that is anti-imperialist, that is extremely critical of capitalism, that will not reproduce the kinds of hierarchies and oppressions that we often find happens, you know, where our LGBT brothers and sisters 
and family and other marginalized groups can have a safer space and feel at home in our movements as well. And so I think that healing has a huge place in our movements and in our music and the kinds of identities that we're constructing as as well. There's this need to just rush out and do things without doing any kind of introspective work as well and how we are reproducing the system and how we are complicit in the day-to-day -day running of that system that it's easier to just go, yeah, the man and yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, yeah. you know, white supremacy and whatever. We support those companies. We support those channels. <laughs> we buy. Right, it's right. Black Friday in a few days' time. <laughs> Black <laughs> money is going to go out of people's pockets. You know what I mean? So so right. I think it requires a lot of other kind of work. And just spitting about things are not enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. Look here. No, no better last words than those. Unfortunately, that will have to do it. For, for this edition of I Mix What I Like here at the Real News Network. Dr. Rico Chapman, Shaheen Arvdeen, thank you both very much for joining me uh, on this segment. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Thanks great. And thank you for joining us here at I Mix What I Like on the Real News Network. And as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. Peace. I mix what I like, what I like.